We have one song that will be sung from here rather than the, the song book. And there's some lyrics for some of the special music if you want to see what's being said. But other than that, let's start with a prayer, shall we? Bow our heads. Lord, we are searching, always searching for meaning, searching for hope, searching for guidance and community and connection. We pray that today as we come together and worship that you will descend upon us, fill this house of worship with your presence, fill our hearts with love and peace and our minds with stillness, with confidence that knows that you are leading us through all the paths of our life. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Good morning. Um, songbooks are on the chair in front of you, but our first song is the yellow sheet in your handout. If you would, let's stand and sing Breathe. song is on page 73 in the songbook. He's got the whole world in his hands.
The Lord said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, because I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Lord is Jesus Christ, it's you we turn to today knowing that you have all the power that we need to overcome the hardships in our life, to heal us of the things that hurt us and hurt others. We open ourselves up to you, Lord, praying that you fill us with love and light, fill us with what is good and what is true, and show us the way to heaven, not just later, but in this world now. May we experience heavenly states now as we try to live by your word. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O oh Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Amen. I invite you all to be seated, and children, I welcome you to come up for your talk. There you are. Good morning, good morning. Those are cool shorts you have on. I like those. You like his shorts? Yeah. <laughs> well, good to see you all this morning. We're going to tell a story today about uh, the disciples. Do you know who the disciples were? Well, the disciples were people that followed Jesus in the world. They lived with him and learned from him and learned how to heal people and how to help people and to teach the Lord's truth. So they were very special. And um, as they were working on this, one of the things that they did is they went, got in a boat have you ever been in a boat? Anybody here? No? Um, I... Been in a boat? I have. I went on a boat um, oh, nice. to um, Manhattan, I think, once. Oh, nice. Okay. It was a ferry. So some of you have been in boats. Have you ever been in a boat in a storm? Anybody here? No. No? What do you think would happen to the boat if there was a storm? The boat would sink. And all the Sorry? people would die and sink. Oh, if all the people would die and it would sink. That could happen. That's true. Water get on the ship. Yeah, that water get on the ship. It'd be wet, right, and windy. Yep. Thank you. Um, the boat would probably be in danger of being struck by lightning. It could be in danger of being struck. Yep. So it'd be a little. It would be unsafe. You would think, right? If it was very windy, a big storm, it would feel unsafe. Well, the disciples are in the boat going across the sea, and a big storm comes up, and that's what this story is about. How they get through that, and I don't know, I read that story to you, and we can talk about it. This is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water, just like you said, right? Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. 
The disciples woke him, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. Who was he that the winds and waves obeyed him? He's That's the Lord. The son of the Lord. He's the Lord, yes. The son of God, right? So he had all the power. He was God on earth. And he had the power to do that. But they didn't really know for sure about that yet. So they were learning all that sort of stuff. So it's interesting. So they're in this boat. There's a big storm and waves are breaking over it. There's wind. And what is the Lord doing? What did it say? Remember? He was sleeping. He was sleeping. <laughs> Do you think you'd be able to sleep in the boat if it was a raging storm? No. I don't think I'd be able to sleep at all. Maybe no. Either. Yes. Also, the baby might wake up. That's true also. Yeah. So they're in the boat and the winds and waves come up. So... Have you ever been scared in your life or worried? Yeah. yeah. Or maybe anxious a little bit? Yeah. And that's a little bit like, you know, what the disciples are experiencing. They're afraid, and it feels like there's a storm in our lives when that's happening. It feels like, oh, something's coming at me, and it's not safe, and I don't feel safe. And what we can do is the same thing that the disciples did in the story, which was to wake up the Lord. Now, do you think the Lord's really asleep in our lives? Do we sometimes forget about the Lord and say, oh, yeah, I don't need to listen to what the Lord has to say? Yeah, we do. Sometimes we ignore it or we don't pay attention to it. Yeah, so we need to wake the Lord up or we need to wake up ourselves as to the Lord's presence in our life. Do any of you guys want to imagine that you're in a boat with wind and waves? Anyone want to do that? Okay, if you'd like to do that, why don't you stand right here in the middle and if I get some volunteers to, right, right up there, how about right next to Freya? I need some wind makers to help me. Oh, well, I'm going to get you to stand. Oh, you want to help out? Okay, you can do that. Here, you can take this one. And I have some, oh, John, I'll need you for something else. Yeah, yeah, okay. We have some, we get the water too. And Henrik, I have one more person who wants to spray small children. <laughs> All right, there you go. Thank you. So what would be great is if you guys could get maybe in front of them. And so you guys want to turn that way. And, and um, just what you do with that, can I demonstrate for a second? Yep. You create wind like this. OK, just be careful not to hit anybody. With that. So we got three people creating lots of wind for you. OK, do you feel that? Okay, and then the spray from the, from the waves is coming at you as well. So anytime you want that to stop, all you have to do is say, Lord, wake up. There you go. Good job. You want to do it again, or is that enough? I want to do that again. All right. Let's do that again. Now, it's up to you guys when you want to stop this. You say, Lord, wake up. Lord, wake up. Very good. Thank you, my demonstration team. It works. It works. It works magically. Thank you very much. I'm wet. You're wet. Now, the reason I want to tell you that story is because, um, like I said, sometimes we forget about the Lord. My seat's a little wet, huh? Yeah, it's very slippery. Sometimes we forget that the Lord is there, and it seems like the Lord's asleep, but it's really that we need to wake ourselves up and go, oh, how can I pay attention to what the Lord's presence might mean or what the Lord might say to me? And um, what I wanted to do is give you a little card here that has some, a quote from Scripture on it, but what it's telling us is one thing we can do is remember and talk about it all the time. Like the, I'm going to read this to you. It says, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Let these words that I command you today be written on your heart. How are you going to write it on your heart? Hmm. Well, that's written on our heart when we think about it and practice it and love what the Lord says. 
And then it says, teach them diligently to your children and repeat them again and again. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you lie down at night and when you get up in the morning. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So it sounds like the Lord wants us to think about these things quite a lot. And if we do that, the Lord will be awake or we will be awake to the Lord's presence in our life. And when we have storms like that, we will be able to help, the Lord will help to be able to calm them, okay? So I want to take one of these with you. Anybody who wants one, Me. take one. You might want to try to... Are they all the same? They're all exactly the same. Anybody else want some? Well, if you want some, if the adults want some, anybody wants one, you can help yourself. <laughs> Yeah, of course. I think I would like to take one for my little sister. Well, how about you guys pass them around? Is that a good idea? Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. All right, thanks for listening. Let's sing our next song. Our next song is on page 28. Let's stand and sing, Blessed Be Your Name.
Freely we have received, freely we give. I want you to bow your heads for a blessing on the children. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. I invite the children and teens to go to their programs while we sing one more song. That song is Let the River Flow on page 102. Next reading will be shared by Nigel Brown. This reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. So they arrived at the other side of the lake, in the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man in the, lived in the burial caves and could no longer be re restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as often he was, 
He snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirits, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. And there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there, fully clothed, perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the town, 10 towns of the region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Thank you. Our final reading for today is from the Heavenly Doctrine for the New Church from a work called True Christianity. This is portion of paragraph 68. The more we follow the divine design in the way we live, the more power we receive from God's omnipotence to fight against forms of evil and falsity, because no one can resist evils or the falsities that go with them except God alone. All forms of evil and falsity are from hell. There they stick together as one thing, exactly the same way all forms of goodness and truth do in heaven. To God, the totality of heaven is like one human being. On the other hand, hell is like one giant monster. Going against one evil and its falsity is going against that whole giant monster of hell. No one can do it except God because he is omnipotent. Clearly then, unless we seek help from God Almighty, we have no more power of our own against evil and falsity than a fish has against the ocean, or a gnat against a whale, or a piece of dust against a mountain that is falling on it. On our own, the power we have against evil is much smaller than the power a locust has against an elephant or a fly against a camel. Furthermore, our power against evil and falsity is even weaker because we are born into evil. Evil cannot act against itself. Therefore, we have to follow the divine design in the way that we live. We have to acknowledge God, his omnipotence, and our resulting safety from hell, and do our part to fight against the evil that is with us. This acknowledgement and this fighting go together as part of the divine design. Otherwise, we cannot help being plunged into hell and swallowed up. And once there, we cannot help being driven by evils one after the other, like a little rowboat on the sea being pushed around by storms. Amen. Here in our lessons, and blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. darkness, my old friend, I've come to talk 
walk with you again because a vision softly he creeping left its seed while I was sleeping and the vision that was planted in my brain still Within the sounds of silence, in restless dreams I walked along narrow streets of cobblestone, neath the halo of a hay street lamp, I turned my collar to the cold and dead. When my eyes were stabbed by the flash of a neon light that split the night and touched the sound of silence. And in the naked light I saw 10,000 people, maybe more. talking without speaking, people hearing without listening, people writing songs that voices never shared, no one dared disturb the sounds of silence. How you do not know silence like a cancer grows. Hear my words that I might teach you. Take my arms that I might treat you. But my Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. It's a matter of housekeeping. It's like people fanning themselves. If someone check the air conditioner and make sure it's actually working, <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. So as human beings, our lives are pretty messy. I think we know that, and I think that Everybody can relate to that in different ways. And we have bad habits, we have addictions that we are dealing with, and we get angry and we get lustful and resentful, and we can act aggressively towards others and be critical of people. We have lots of fears that well up inside of us and we can get discouraged, we can be apathetic, and the list can go on and on, right? But thank you for it. But that is not the whole story of our lives, is it? Because our lives are also very beautiful at the same time. 
We can all be very loving. We can be caring and tender and sweet to other people. We can be patient. We can be full of conviction and purpose. We can be faithful, affirming, and generous. People in our lives can bring us to tears from both joy and sorrow. It's very vibrant to be a human being. It's very interesting how we can often be both ourselves, how we can be very wonderful and kind and generous, and we can also be really unkind and hurtful. We talked about this last week a little bit where, you know, we know that we can change that, though, because you might be in your house and you're yelling because it's so messy, like, what's going on here? What did you do this? And, what? and the phone rings, and you're like, hey, how are you doing? So nice to hear you, right? We can change so quickly if we want to. We can change that how we're doing. Or if you're driving to a party with your partner and uh, you're fighting on the way. Has that ever happened to anybody arguing in the car? And you get into the party and say, hey, everything's great. How are you? I'm wonderful. Good. So happy to see you. So we can turn it on and off if we want to. And that's the encouraging thing about it is that we can change. The power to do it is there somewhere. So why don't we change those habits? Or why don't we leave addictions behind if we are suffering from them? Well, we're taught that if we do something a few times from intention, it becomes very hard to stop doing it. And it says the reason that is is because it continually clings to our thoughts. Once we do it from sort of intention, it starts to just always show up in our minds. And that's why the writings where, uh, beware. They say, let people beware of actual evils. Beware of them, because when you dive into them, when you partake of them, they start to cling to you, and they start to get in our minds and our thoughts. And a passage says that the reality is that by deliberate acts of, of will, we become actually organically connected with hellish societies or hellish communities. So it's almost like these ties that we have when we behave that way. And it creates a bond that's really hard to break. Because once we've indulged in some bad, hurtful behavior once or twice, it quickly becomes difficult to stop because of those ties. So here's that passage or passage that talks about that. When we first from consent, then from purpose, and at last from the delight of affection, cast ourselves into evil, then a hell is opened, which is in that evil, and there afterward takes place an influx from that hell. When we come into evil this way, it clings to us, for the hell in the sphere of which we then are is in its very delight when in its evil, and therefore it does not desist but obstinately presses in and causes us to think about that evil at first occasionally and afterward as often as anything presents itself which is related to it. And at last it becomes with us that which reigns universally. So that sounds pretty rough to get away from. If we do that, it continually clings to us. It becomes more a part of who we are. And it even goes on, the passage says, if we continue in those behaviors, we find ways to make it honorable and even excusable and wonderful that we are participating in those things. So you can really take it as far as you want to go. And that explains the power of habits or addictions and why it's not so easy to just walk away from them and why we can't do it by ourselves. So that's one side of things. The other side of things is that we desperately want to be connected with other people. We want to love we want to be loved. We want to be part of people's lives, right? We want to be connected to them. And often out of fear of rejection, we remain alone, unable to get help. And that's because the influence of the hells is reminding us that if other people knew the exact nature of our wrongs or of our behaviors, that they wouldn't understand and they wouldn't like us. That's the message they offer us. So as long as they can keep us in the dark, they win because hell thrives under a cloak of darkness, of a cover of darkness. All right, so all that being said, the children of Israel, that story of the children of Israel being slaves in Egypt and being led out of slavery into the wilderness to the promised land is the story that epitomizes our spiritual growth and recovery. It's a cornerstone story, and we mention it often. And the main problem of the children of Israel was that they were slaves, right? That was the big issue, is that we're slaves in Egypt. Okay, if you're a slave to something, you might just substitute and say, well, I'm addicted to this thing because I can't 
get away from it. I can't walk away. I'm not free to do that. I am enslaved by it. It doesn't matter. It could be anything. Point is, if I've tried to stop doing something and I can't, maybe I have an addiction. Or maybe I have a problem, at the very least. And you might say, well, I'm not one of those kinds of people. I don't, I don't know. I'm fine. I can get myself out of it. And then my next question is, well, why haven't you then? <laughs> right? If you could, then why haven't you? Or why haven't we? Now, you can choose to call things like these addictions or not. That's up to you. But the truth is, I think the same principles apply to be removed from them. An addict is a slave to his or her habits. And the word comes from the Latin addictus, which in Roman law meant a debtor, someone who was awarded as a slave to their creditor. So you're not free to walk away, just like someone who's a slave to a slave owner can't walk away. We're unable to do that. So being addicted means we're unable to get away from it. But using the word addiction is not an excuse. It's real. I mean, if you're addicted to something, if you have that behavior, it doesn't mean, well, I can't do anything about it. It means I can. I just need to work on it. And the good news of this children of Israel story is that they are freed from their slavery. And they led through the wilderness, through the promised land, eventually. And it's a journey. And it's not welcome news that it's a journey. I know it would be nice if we could just hop on a plane in Cairo and fly to, is to Jerusalem and say, hey, I'm out of slavery. I'm now living in the promised land, and it's great. There's a journey involved, right? And it takes all life to do that. So the good news is that we can work on it, and we're not going to do it by ourselves. So today's story is about this kind of life, attachment to disorder, to addiction, evil, bad behavior, whatever word you like to use. So in the story, Jesus had crossed the sea and come to the Gerasenes, and a man met him with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and he was possessed by demons. So if you have an addiction or a habit you can't break, it feels like you're possessed by a force that's beyond your control. It's like, why can't I walk away from this? Why can't I put this down? Why can't I stop this behavior, right? And it shows that in the story. It says no one could bind him, not even with chains. He couldn't be bound. He'd often broke them and pulled out of them, but then he was put back into them again. Because when we're suffering from an addiction, there's times when we break free, like, oh, yes, I've broken free. I'm done with that. And before we know it, we're back into it again, right? Those bonds are hard to get separation from forever. But the more we work on it, the more we can get free from that. And nothing seems more important to someone when they're in their addiction than the addiction itself. When you want to be, when it's starting to, that itch is starting to, to come and we want to scratch it, nothing seems more important than that. Nothing takes our attention more than that. It's an interesting thing that's true of this order, whether we call it an addiction or not, is this double life that we lead. It feels like something struggling for dominance. So it says about the man, the demon-possessed man, that he dwelled in the mountains and he dwelled in the tombs. Mountains signify love to the Lord, wanting to do the Lord's will. It's a high place of resolve. Living in the tombs is those things of our lower nature, a part of us that sort of selfish delight that, that are hurtful. We'll call it the addiction in this case. So sometimes we're in the mountains, sometimes we're in the tombs, but the same person is dwelling in both places. And that's one of the hardest things, is because you've been on the mountain, you know what the mountain's like, and then you find yourself back in the tomb. It's like, what in the world is going on? Why can't we stop? And it causes a lot of grief, it causes a lot of sadness. Because you can love the things of religion, you can love the Lord, and sincerely, very sincerely, and still find yourself in filthy pleasures. Think about a dedicated husband, loves his wife, but he's still going to the internet or pornography. He's like, well, how is he living both those ways? Well, there's the mountain and there's the tomb. Or a loving parent loves their children, wants is gentle a lot of the time, but sometimes yelling and shaming their child. The same person doing both of those things. Or a pill of society, he needs to hit the bottle, needs to take pills, addicted to them. How is that person who seems so strong doing both of those things? And the man of the story is crying out. And I think that symbolizes well as we cry out to the Lord, you know, I'll, I'll never do it again. I'll stop. It's the last time. 
a promise. And how many times do we do that and find yourself, well, that wasn't really the last time, I guess. Um, I promised, but there we are again. And it says he was cutting himself with stones. Of course, cutting is a real thing that people sometimes do, sometimes just cut through the numbness to feel some control, to provide some relief from a terrible feeling. And that can become an obsession as well. But you can see from the story itself, it's damaging, it's hurtful. And what it pictures is using truths, which are stones, actually to hurt us rather than to help us. We might shame ourselves, think we're no good, or we twist the truth around in ways that harm us. That falsity of self-loathing and condemnation that we sometimes heap upon ourselves. So we can't use the truth in a helpful way. We use it in a way that's hurting us rather than helping us. So that describes a pretty sad state of being. But it's important to note that people will try all kinds of things to help us, right? We'll try all kinds of things to help ourselves, but things have to get pretty bad often in order for us to turn it around. It's called hitting bottom. Realizing we can't do it alone, so we wake up. And Jesus shows up on the scene, and Jesus had crossed the sea. I think it's interesting that they were crossing the sea, and the storm had arisen, and they had to wake up the Lord. Because I think the big step that we have to take is to become aware and awake of the Lord's presence. And they asked in the story, who is this man that he can calm the sea in the storm? And they're starting to realize the power that the Lord has and that who the Lord really is. And that's an essential part of anyone's spiritual recovery or recovery from substance abuse is we have to recognize that there's a power greater than ourselves that can help us. It's very important to believe that our God has enough power to help us to be removed from the things that we're struggling with. So we cannot change without the Lord's help. You heard that story, the, the paragraph that I read from the writings about, you know, it's like a giant monster. We're trying to fight against this all by ourselves, and we can't do it. But in the story, he ran and he worshiped Jesus, and it pictures that recognition. Even in those troubled states, we can recognize that. And that's the important thing in a 12-step movement is those steps of recognizing that there's a power that can help us. Here's one of the steps that says, we admitted we were powerless over whatever it is, and that our lives had become unmanageable. This demon-possessed man's life is completely unmanageable. He's come to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Essential, essential, essential point of the story. We have to believe that. We have to work on that belief. And when we do this, the Lord says, come out of the man unclean spirit. And he says, well, what is your name? And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And that ties in again with the idea of there's so many things tied up in any particular habit or behavior that we're involved in. We just, we might think, oh, it's, it's lust I'm dealing with, or oh, it's, it's addiction to painkillers I'm dealing with, or oh, it's, it's criticism I'm dealing with. But if you start to really look into those things, you start to maybe stop a particular behavior, something else comes up that you see, oh, I see there's some actually a wound behind that or a hurt behind that or some other behavior. It's, there's all kinds of tendrils connected there that we have to, the Lord really, will have to sort of untie slowly over time as we do this work. You can't just yank out the weeds. It takes out all the good stuff with the garden as well. So there are many things. As that passage said, all of hell is like a gi single gigantic monster. Consequently, to act against a single evil and its falsity is to act against that gigantic monster or hell. And this no one is able to do except God. So bearing in mind, it's more than just what we might think we're dealing with. It's not just the lust, it's not just the fear, it's not just the anger, there's things beneath it as well. Another important thing too, why I encourage you to read the word daily, to pray daily, to, uh, to be connected with, you know, throw yourself into spiritual study or whatever it is, because the Lord cannot or evil spirits cannot stand the presence of the Lord. It fills their minds with anxiety and they have to leave. That's why those spirits left the possessed man. He said, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. They can't stand being in the presence of the Lord. And they beg to be sent out of the country, or he begged not to be sent out of the country because they don't want to leave us. The hells that control us do not want to leave us, but they were cast into the swine, 
a lot of people who are animal activists hate this story because it's like, all right, why do all the swine have to die? It's like, all right, I understand that. That's not the point. The point is this is allegorical and it's saying that the pigs in the story symbolize filthy loves that are part of our life. Sorry about that, but that's what they picture. And the picture of running into, hell, into the sea is them being put back into hell where they came from, which is what the sea pictures. And we need to know that all of this is something that happens little by little as we do the work. So often it's not, what we're given is not the change itself, but the ability to get up, dust ourselves off, and try again the next time. Because every time we do something like that, we stop a little bit, we think about how we shouldn't be doing that, that is some kind of progress. Our change begins in our mind. The word repentance means changing our mind. And we begin by examining ourselves, acknowledging what our faults are, and praying to the Lord for help, and little by little, starting to live differently. The Lord says it's not as hard as we think. If we can change our thinking around it, we can change our behavior. And it says this, it's simply a matter of, number one, recognizing when something attractive comes up that we know is dishonest or unfair. So we go, okay, this is something I shouldn't do. The second is, well, the first thing is just recognizing. The second is, this is not to be done. I shouldn't do this, number two. Number three, it is against the divine commandments. If we do those three things, it says, if we get used to thinking like this and from this familiarity form a habit, then we're gradually united to heaven. And then I love how the passage goes on. However, once the process has started, the Lord works his wonders within us and causes us not only to see evils, but to refuse them and eventually to turn away from them. This is the meaning of the Lord's words. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then the writings even talk about an easier. If that's too hard, here's an easier kind of repentance. It's even called that. Oh, here's an easier kind of repentance, okay? And when I hear those kinds of things, I'm like, all right, I like that. Give me an easier way. It says, so I propose to describe an easier kind of repentance. When we are turning over in our minds some evil deed and intending to do it, we should say to ourselves, I am thinking about this and I intend to do it, but I shall not do it because it is a sin. And I think what I like about that is recognizing, yep, I want to do it. I'm really, this is where I want to go, but I'm not going to. Instead of just saying, no, I don't really want that. Yeah, I really do want that, but I'm not going to. And then the Lord can work his wonders within us and break those bonds and free us. Well, if you don't believe it works, try going to 12-step meetings. Even if you don't have a particular issue, go and listen to people's stories. There's plenty of people walking around among us who have been addicted to very hard things and are walking free because they're doing that work and getting support in it. So it's a daily thing, and, but with God, all things are possible. So I just invite you to, tr to stop trying to be Superman or Spider-Man or Wonder Woman or whoever your favorite superhero is that you think you are and do it all by yourself. Recognize that we need others, we need the Lord, and if we do that, we can break free. As the Lord said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. I'd like to bow our heads for a prayer. Lord, it's very easy to feel like we will have success over our habits and addictions when we're sitting here with you and with each other. We have high resolve and trust in you. And when we walk out those doors and we face temptation or we face hardship or criticism, it, the weaknesses come back quickly. Lord, help us to remember this moment with you and to find help where we need it and to keep connecting with you, keep waking you up, and waking ourselves up to your presence in our life. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We have a moment if you have any prayer requests that you would like to ask. We'll have a minute of silent prayer following that. But anything on your mind or heart today? Thank you. 
for your brother-in-law, Ralph, who had a stroke. Okay. Thank you, Meg. Don? Prayers for Forrest Kasson. Thank you, Don. Daniel. Okay. Prayers for their strength and support. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel. The places on earth that are burning. Prayers for that. Thank you. Healed. Anything else? All right. Let's have a minute of silent prayer. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Are you to stand for the closing of the word? Let's sing one more song on page 206. You are the way. 206. There's a road that leads to happiness. There's a bridge that spans the emptiness between God and man. There's a light that is the light of man. There's a truth that brings us back. truth and the light you are the way the truth and the light you are the way the truth and the light you are the way the truth and the light you're the reason for my Two.
Topic, so we're going to leave you with a little sunshine. Here comes the sun. It's all right. Thank you all for being here today, and uh, I have a test card for you and a microphone if anyone has any comments or questions or thoughts. Thank you, Fred. You like both? Or just that? Anyone? <laughs> I see it. I'm following you. <laughs> so today is Celebration Sunday, and I have something I want to share with you. It's been 26 years in August since I followed Mr. Wright into the US. And during these 26 years, one of the wonderful things has been becoming a part of this community and all the great friends I made here. 
So I want to share, when I was going through the very difficult process of making this decision, I opened the Bible and I read this sentence that said, the pouring people will welcome me. And it's been so true and I appreciate it. Thank you mm. very much. Well, thanks, Marcia. I love that his name is Mr. Wright. That's very helpful. <laughs> right. Anybody else have anything? Dwight? Mine is a question. Why are the addictions so powerful? Why is it so hard yeah. to follow the Lord? Excellent question. Well, because every, every delight, or every, everything has a delight connected with it, both good things and bad things. And the, the natural delights are, or the, the evil delights are connected to hell, societies of hell, so they're kind of pulling at you. And they, they don't want you to break free from them because they're not very pleasant. But at the same time, I think the hard part is they hit us on a sensual level where things seem most real and they seem most powerful. Um, like bodily appetite seems so strong compared to you know, the still small voice of the Lord of doing the right thing or being kind or gentle. Those delights, those have wonderful delights that are lasting, but they don't seem as, I think of it as you know, evil spirits like walking around with pots and pans, like, look, pay attention to me, bam, 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 bam. Like really noisy and want to get our attention and what they're connected to are often things that are connected to sensory experience, which feels very powerful. Like the, in the Garden of Eden story, that was the snake that deceived them, it was the, which symbolizes our senses. It's our senses that trip us up. So uh, I think that's a lot of it is because we are very s sense oriented. So if it feels good, we like it and we want more of it um, until we can rise above that and start to break free of that and see something deeper and more lasting. So uh, I don't know, that's a partial answer. Does anyone else want to add to that? Trish wants to add to that. Trish, Thank you. Can okay, we give you the mic, please? Oh. Sorry. Just because the people watching online won't be able to hear you. Um, emotions are delicious. So <clears throat> be willing to hang out with your emotions because then you're not trying to escape them with your addiction. And I would just say like that's a way of, of just like thinking about it because I feel like we're just we think emotion, our negative emotions are just too painful. We can't deal with them. So we drink or we smoke or we do whatever we do. But if you sit with them and get to know them. Thank you, Trish. Uh, back here. Thanks, Trish. Um, I, I've never been here before, but I've read Swedenborg's work. And. Um, about a, a little over a year ago, I really turned over my consciousness to my higher self through God. And uh, I had two major addictions that aren't, you know, drugs that would kill you, but I had two major addictions. And I just realized I've been going through really severe stress, and I realized that they are gone. Mm -hmm. And it's been a year. And um, two things that have tormented me. I've gone to therapy for many years. Um, and really, I think it's that I turned it over. Hmm. And I was getting closer to my spirit. And they're not compatible anymore. And if I still had them, I'm under very severe stress right now. It should be happening. I guess I just wanted to kind of share hope. Yeah. I'm 53. I've been struggling with these two things my entire life. Hmm. And I'm just, it's just sort of settling into me that I think it's gone, and I think it's over, and it's healing from God, obviously. Yeah. I guess I just wanted to share it. Thank you. appreciate Thank you sharing that. It's good to hear stories like that. Barbara? Yeah. So what really stood out for me during your talk, and it just seemed so wonderful and, and kind of simple, was that the evil spirits don't want to be in the presence of the Lord. Right. So I just, I love that idea that if I'm praying or thinking about God, that you said that makes them anxious, so they leave. So I just really like that idea that I can, I can make them anxious or make them leave by 
inviting the Lord in. Kind of, and it reminded me kind of how Dracula can't stand the mm. sunlight. Yeah. Or the spiders when you're cleaning the basement, you open, ah, the, the light comes in. Thank you, Barbara. Um, coming back to what you asked, Dwight, a little bit, I think often an addiction is, is, in, is there because there's pain that we don't want to deal with. And so it's easier, put it that way, it's easier to go this way than to feel that pain, to really feel it and sit with it and to, I mean, I think that's a lot of it is it seems like a better choice, it seems easier, and once we can, you know, sort of face it and go through it, we can sort of shed that layer of it and maybe the pain doesn't have to be numb so much. Um, I think of a lot of it is, is, is numbing behavior. What are we trying to avoid? What are we trying to numb? What are we trying to get away from? And if we can find out what that is, for whatever means that is, self-discovery and so forth, then we can, it becomes less essential that we have to escape it because we go, oh, that's, that's what it is. And Kira has his hand up. I, mean, I don't know the science of it, but I think that part of what you're talking about is that like the dopamine or whatever it is that you get from fulfilling the addiction is much more immediate and easy. Yeah. Whereas I think I like Trish's idea of that deliciousness, but I think that the same pipes that that deliciousness come through is also the pipes that the pain comes through. Hmm. And you have to clear that pain or something or find peace with it before you can get to that deliciousness. At least that's kind of my experience. And I don't know the science of it, but I think there's science hmm. with words like dopamine and yeah. other things that I don't know. There is science. Anyone know the science? <laughs> I'm not. Trish knows the science. Do you want to speak to the science? Okay. Anything else? One thing that I think... What was your name in the back? I didn't, you didn't, I, Lindsay, you had mentioned something about um, turning it over, and it kind of, or uh, one of the things that helped me is saying, I'm, I'm not that kind of person. I don't want to be that kind of person. Just saying, disassociating myself with the thing that I'm struggling with and saying, no, nope, that's not me. And that helps a lot to just say, no, I'm not, that's not who I'm going to be. Um, so I just want to throw that out. That's what you, what you meant, said and reminded me of. Kai has his hand up. It's interesting because to me, all addictions are a way of being more lonely, <laughs> if you think about it. I mean, mm -hmm. not many, we don't do much addiction where we're trying to connect with other people, you know? I find that just a fascinating concept. So whenever I'm, you know, whatever, I want to, I find I get reinvigorated when I connect with people. Right. And my addictions <laughs> do the opposite opposite. So if you like being alone and lonely and sad, uh, addictions are a great way to get there, if you will. I mean, if you can think of it in those terms, like this addiction is making me disconnected from God, disconnected from my family, disconnected. I, I don't know anyone who thinks that's just a swell party, you know, so to speak. So right. I don't know, just, just to think about it. But, Thanks. Yeah, and the opposite of, what, of loneliness requires vulnerability, and that's a scary thing for a lot of us, so we shun it. Did you have your hand up, Don? Or you, is that it? Anyone else? I didn't want to cut anyone off. Okay. 